truly, truly listen. It's actually not so easy because as leaders, sometimes we believe that the reason why we were given the top job is because we know better than the rest. And so we're going to tell them what they have to do. And uh, every list, every CEO I work with will strongly believe that they listen well, mm-hmm. of course, <laughs> but they don't. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a... It's a a skill that takes time to develop. And it's a very precious skill because when you start listening and giving a voice to the others, the the quality of the conversation really increases. And we've uh, experienced that many, many times with the the teams that we support, where instead of uh, having the CEO telling what they want, occasionally asking a few questions, usually having two or three of the extroverts on the team speaking up and and capturing 90% of the talk time when the rest of the team remains silent. That is Mm -hmm. not a very productive way to lead the top team. And when we change those dynamics and we make a, a systematic effort to hear everyone on the team and we remove all the interruptions, so we just listen and people know that they can speak without being interrupted. And then we move to the next person and the next person. And so at the end, it takes a little bit of time, yes, but the quality of the of the conversation increases exponentially. So this this ability to open yourself, as you mm-hmm. say, mm-hmm. open your mind, open your heart, mm-hmm. open your soul and see what comes. And that, it, it sounds very fluffy for hard-nosed corporate executives to do that but it really works it really works living in uh, dubai no in singapore and singapore i mean sorry yeah yeah yeah. no i'm uh i'm a long-term resident uh, of singapore i went there in uh, 97 so that's Mm. uh what is it, like 27 years ago? Yes. Yeah, so that's home, really. I, You know, I'm in France right now, but I always say, you know, I'm, I'm going back home to Singapore, even though I grew up in Paris. So technically, this this is my country here in France, but I, it doesn't feel like my country, mm-hmm. really. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to visit as a tourist. It's mm-hmm. a beautiful country, and mm-hmm. uh, but I'm very happy not to live in France. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I can understand you because I'm I'm an earthling. I'm I'm let's say I'm not from Barcelona, not my family and so. But I'm from Barcelona, and, and especially now that I live 19 years. But I was only one week here, and I felt home. Hmm. No, so I imagine it's the same with you. And you you were there, and you already were home from the start. Yeah, two things on on this. Uh, I believe we all have a place of belonging Mm -hmm. and the question is to find it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the place of belonging may be the place where you grew up because Mm -hmm. it's your culture, it's your family, your friends, uh, but it doesn't have to be. And um, the the other thing is that you have to look for it. Otherwise you, you may or may not find it. And so, Wherever, you know, I lived in London, I lived in Spain, I lived in Indonesia. And every everywhere I've, I've gone, I, I went with the attitude to see, you know, can I make this place my home? Yeah. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Spain really feels like home. London never felt like home. No. <laughs> UK will never feel like home. I, I like going to yeah. London. It's a beautiful, yeah. you know, it's so an, such an interesting city. Yes. But it will never feel like home. Yes. No matter how many hundreds of million dollars I will have on my bank account, it would still be a weird place. You know, I could yeah. never make it shape it into, into my home. Yes. Uh, true. Indonesia doesn't feel like home. I, I love Indonesia. I, I travel to Jakarta on a monthly basis. Mm-hmm. Many friends there. It, mm-hmm. I feel very comfortable in Indonesia. I speak Indonesian, but it will never be mm. home for me. Singapore instantly felt felt mm-hmm. like home. Yes, I'm not Singaporean. I don't look like a Singaporean. <laughs> I, 
<laughs> I'm one foot taller than the average guy in Singapore, but it's it feels like home. And, yeah, and flying, of, yeah. flying back to Singapore is like mm. going home for me. Yes, yes, I can relate. That's uh, beautiful. And, and yeah. plus, as I hear you're someone like me also, well, having been in, in many places now, living, living in many places. And then I hear out of you that uh, you speak several languages also. Huh? And then you, and, and you, you cannot to understand <laughs> other cultures if you don't speak at least another language mm -hmm. fluently. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to speak all the languages, mm -hmm. but it's the ability to immerse yourself in another culture because you speak the language reshapes your brain. Yes. And I think. And that may be very judgmental. I don't know. I, I guess there's no judgment in what I'm saying. But no. if you only speak one language, the example that comes to mind immediately are, are people from the US because their country is so big mm -hmm. that you could travel for hours and hours and hours mm -hmm. and still be in the United States, yes. which most other country in the world doesn't have that luxury to have such a an immense territory and such a beautiful territory that they, there's hardly a need to speak any other language. But yeah. then wherever uh, they go in, in the world, the, their brain is not shaped to even understand that other people have different cultures and different languages mm -hmm. and different ways of doing things because their, their home market, their home territory is so, so large. I come from a mid-sized country, France. Obviously, you need to understand that you're not the center of the world, although most French people believe that they're at the center of the universe. <laughs> and, and occasionally there's times when I agree with that, but uh, joke aside, yeah. it, you know, you, you have to understand that there's other people and other cultures. And one way to, to shape your brain in, in really making this a reality is to be able to converse in a, in a different language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I never felt that I could live in a country without understanding the language. Mm -hmm. And it always amazes me, particularly in Southeast Asia, because in a way it's, it's paradise on earth. Yeah. I, I don't want to, this is not an advertising for <laughs> Southeast Asia, but you know, we, we live in, in, in such a beautiful part of the world and within two, three hours flight from Singapore, you have Bali, you have mm -hmm. Phuket, you have Koh Samui, you have Vietnam, mm -hmm. Burma, etc. Right? It's, it's, and there's expatriates who live in those countries, yes. particularly Thailand has been extremely welcoming for foreigners. And so there's tons of foreigners living in Bangkok, in Phuket, in, in other places, mm -hmm. and they don't speak a word of Thai. Mm -hmm. And that's okay for them. Mm -hmm. And I've never really been able to relate to that. How, how can you live in a country in, if you don't speak at least street language, ordering food, giving in directions to a taxi driver, being able to fix something, call a plumber or call someone who's going to fix your garden or, or, or something in your house. If you're not able to function like that and you always need to go through an interpreter, how can you really be in contact with the culture? Mm -hmm. So I, when I moved to Spain, I was 24 years old, and after three months, I was able to to work in in Spanish. Spanish, yeah. Uh, yeah. I had no choice; no no one spoke yeah. English or French yeah. around me, so I had to speak Spanish. And so, survival is a very powerful motivator, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. I learned to speak Spanish. Then, a little, when I was a little bit older, I moved to to Jakarta, and I spent a few years in Indonesia. And again, I I didn't mm -hmm. want to rely on just uh, asking others to speak English for me. I, I wanted to be able to speak Indonesian. Now, my, my Indonesian is atrocious, but I can make small talk. You can, you, you, can, know? you can. And I, I can bring the eyes. I, yeah. I can show that I'm at least I'm making yeah. an effort. <laughs> yes, that's beautiful because I think in what you're explaining, and since you are, you, you well, you have uh, retreats and everything, no? I'm, um, I think in what you're explaining is, is this opening up into into the culture, into the people where you are. No, it's part of the adaptation. It's really opening up and uh, becoming 
um i don't know like i, I don't like to use I like to, to use the word open heart instead of vulnerable, no? because vulnerability has given a, a negative connotation no? in some places. And for me, it's really you're opening up and you're trying your best to have um, to speak the language because you you are there for them and uh, you want well, to be there. No? That's okay experience when yes. you do that yes because usually you'll find that you receive more than you give mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes especially because you're giving you're giving yourself and you are trying and they see that and then that's why when they 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 are really grateful for that for for this uh intention not for this open I, I intention this approach also applies to the, the world of leadership. So if mm -hmm. you're a, a business leader, uh, being able to listen, truly, truly listen, is actually not so easy because as leaders, sometimes we believe that the reason why we were given the top job is because we know better than the rest. And so we're going to tell them what they have to do. And uh, every list, every CEO I work with will strongly believe that they listen well, mm -hmm. of course, <laughs> but they don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a skill that takes time to develop. And it's a very precious skill because when you start listening and giving a voice to the others, the, the quality of the conversation really increases. And we've uh, experienced that many, many times with the, the teams that we support, where instead of uh, having the CEO telling what they want, occasionally asking a few questions, usually having two or three of the extroverts on the team speaking up and, and capturing 90% of the talk time when the rest of the team remains silent. That is mm -hmm. not a very productive way to lead mm -hmm. the top team. And when we change those dynamics and we make a, a systematic effort to hear everyone on the team and we remove all the interruptions, so we just listen and people know that they can speak without being interrupted and then we move to the next person and the next person. And so at the end, it takes a little bit of time, yes, but the quality of the, of the conversation increases exponentially. So this, this ability to open yourself, as you mm -hmm. say, mm -hmm. Open your mind, open your heart, mm -hmm. open your soul and see what comes. And that, it, it sounds very fluffy for hard-nosed corporate executives to do that. But it really works. Yes. It really works. And it makes a tremendous difference. Yes. Yes, it does. It does. I remember, uh, well, I have a team also, I work in IT. And I have a team in SAP, and I have a team uh, which, uh, well, I I I guide them no, and I empower them, and that it's it's for them to grow, not not, and yeah, mostly because if they grow, the business grows, but it's important really to to listen to them, and let them um, decide no what to do or not to do based on, on what you open up for them, for them to grow you know, and, and really love what they're doing. But it, because at, at the end, work is you. You are who you are, wherever you are. <laughs> and uh, it's important that at work, you have the same opportunity to be who you are and create what you love. No? It's not so common, though. It's not so frequent. Actually, anywhere in life, you know, how many yeah. times do you feel that the person with whom you're talking is truly seeing you for who you are and truly listening to you? Yeah, not many times. Silence. It's very rare. Mm -hmm. yes. It's very rare. So I find that as, uh, as corporate leaders, or as coaches, mm -hmm. 
what we can do is to create a space where people can feel that they are being seen and they're being heard and they're being understood. Because that allows them to then really shine and give their best. Yes, to flourish. Yes, absolutely. Flourish is a beautiful world. world. Yes, yes. I like and it. That- and, and that's what you do, no? You so you you support then uh, CEOs in in um, for them to understand the importance to let people flourish, not to guide them into flourishing, so that they for them for them to also acknowledge that if they do that, if they are not leading the old way, like you were saying before, no, I guide, I I I lead you, and you have to do what I tell you. It's not going to grow their business the way they want unless they let people flourish, be motivated, and grow with them, with him or her in the business. No. Yes, that's what I do, and uh... it's not easy. I get a lot of resistance from corporate leaders. Imagine. who say, okay, Fabrice, I understand what you're saying, but what's going to be the impact on the bottom line? Mm-hmm. You could say it's a fair question. As, mm-hmm. as a, yeah. If you see your role as a CEO very uh, narrowly defined as delivering the bottom line or delivering the shareholder value, then yes, whatever you do, whether it's uh, changing the colors of the wall or hiring a new secretary or, or making an acquisition from the smallest thing to the biggest thing, you could reduce everything to the bottom line mm-hmm. and to the shareholder value. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't have an immediate impact, ideally a quarterly impact on, on the shareholder value that the stock market can measure, then you shouldn't do it. Yeah. That's a very narrow definition of, of leadership, but it's, that, it's one that really... Uh, a lot of corporate leaders use, particularly in publicly listed corporations. And my role is to open them up to a a bigger reality and a longer term vision to say, look, not everything that you do that is valuable can be measured in the bottom line or can be measured in in, uh, your share price. There's a lot of things that you can do have that have tremendous value that may or may not be ever having an impact on the bottom line or, or, or may or may not be measurable, but that's still tremendously valuable. Because if we take that narrow vision of my, my job as a corporate leader is to deliver profits and shareholder value, then we end up with the world we have, where we yeah. have absolutely yeah. destroyed yeah. our planet and the environment because we're not really factoring in the cost of destroying the environment in in our bottom lines. And I think that idea is increasingly understood intellectually, but it's Mm -hmm. still not understood spiritually or emotionally by Mm -hmm. most corporate leaders because they still live under the tremendous pressure of their boards that demand uh, short-term performance. Yeah. There's exceptions, for for example, in, in government-owned corporations. And there's also exceptions in privately-owned corporations, particularly family-owned uh, corporations, because families typically take a much longer uh, time horizon. What matters, particularly for families that have been in business for generations and for whom financial success is no longer a question, mm-hmm. then they can say, look, reputation, Mm -hmm. um, preserving the family legacy, having a positive impact on the world is more important than making another billion dollars because you know what, we have have already enough billion dollars on our bank accounts. Uh, So I think salvation will come from privately owned businesses uh, with families that own these businesses and, and can take a longer uh, time outlook and also can take a broader definition of success as not just being the shareholder value, but the impact that the corporation has on all its stakeholders, uh, employees, uh, communities where we operate, uh, the environment, uh, the next generations. Uh, 
That, that's a much, much broader definition of success. Mm -hmm. So I, I play my little role in that uh, ecosystem, uh, working one-on-one -on -one with CEOs, working with their top teams. Uh, about half of the clients I serve come from the world of family-owned businesses, and mm -hmm. the other half are in the in the uh, world of publicly listed uh, uh, corporations with mm. uh, faceless, nameless mm. uh, shareholders uh, that yeah. essentially pursue shareholder value as their sole uh, sole uh, KPI. Yeah, but have you have you found because I believe. Since when people, when many leaders, well, the CEOs or so are too much in their head, they understand it maybe conceptually that you're saying if they understand it, but at the end they have to experience it themselves. So, so I imagine once they, they, they change and they see the impact, they, they change. Also, not not at work only, but somehow they will change. No, also in their being, in the in in who they are, um, at work and outside of work, because they have experienced the 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 potential of really being and listening. It's not so easy. No, no it's not so easy. Yeah. First of all, the the pressure that corporate leaders uh, face is tremendous. Yeah. So it's the, the margin of of maneuver that they have is actually very limited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. And uh, and you could say yes, the CEO is all powerful. Um, mm -hmm. That's actually very far from the truth. Yeah, uh, yeah. a CEO is an employee mm -hmm. appointed by the board mm -hmm. who can be removed by the board at, at very short mm -hmm. notice. Yeah, if mm -hmm. they don't deliver what the board wants. Yeah. And the incentives for the CEO to survive another year and stay in their job for just another year is, is massive on, on, on their bank account. I mean, we're talking about individuals who make between, say, I don't know, whatever, $5 million to right. $50 million a year for the, for the majority of uh, the CEOs in large publicly listed corporations. So let's say, let's say the average is uh, $10 million a year. But you know, if I stay another year, if I hang on to my seat, no yes. matter no matter what I do, no matter at what cost, at what price, if I can hang on to my seat for just another year, it's ten million dollars. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so there's a vested incentive to really hang on to the, to your position. Yes. Now, occasionally you find people who say, you know what, I have enough, and so I'm going to do the right thing. But number one, I don't have never met rich people who said they had enough. <laughs> and and second, doing the right thing might actually mean being removed from your yeah. position at very short notice. And, and that's probably not the most e effective way to try to change the system. If you're going to try to change the system and you operate in a publicly listed environment, I would say try to do it in a stealthy way that where, where the board cannot find objections to what mm -hmm. you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, because you, it's probably easier to change the system from the inside than yeah. from the outside. Always, yeah. Mm. So if you have been lucky and talented enough to be appointed uh, chief exec of a large corporation. Maybe you take that opportunity to pursue a double objective. One is to perform to the satisfaction of your shareholders, and the other one is to try to change the system and create a better environment for your all your your stakeholders. Clearly, the the margins that you have are fairly narrow, but at least it's something, right? And I believe we can we can change. The way the the corporate world operates, you know, one one step at a time. Uh, I, I don't know that big revolutions are, are necessarily the the way to go. Yeah. So it's difficult. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's difficult. There, there's a lot more uh, possibilities to have a true impact if mm -hmm. uh, you own and and run a private business mm -hmm. because you are yeah. you or your family. Are the shareholders, and yes. so you decide what, how much 
is enough and you decide how you're going to conduct uh, yes. your business. And, and there are in the world very large privately owned corporations by, uh, and, uh, or corporations where the majority shareholders are still, you know, the, the, the funding family, the, the mm -hmm. business may be listed, but there's, there's a, still a family that controls the board and controls the, the appointment of the CEO. And so I think that there's, there's a lot more uh, room for maneuver in, in this type of situation. Yeah. 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 And, and, and so you do that and, uh, at, that's your work. I mean, it's your you work in McKenzie. You were saying that, no? and then uh, I, uh, I look after our leadership development practice in Asia. Mm, so I... ah, because then you also have uh, retreats. Because it's, it's all it's all the same. It's all the same. It's it's all you know. Uh, nice, in a way, you say nice. what 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 do I do for a <laughs> uh -huh. living? Uh -huh. uh, I uh, work with uh, business leaders to change their uh, perspectives and support them so that they can create organizations that allow employees to flourish and allow all, all the ecosystem to flourish, right? Mm -hmm. so yes. that, that, that could be a short definition of, of what I do. Now, nice. how do I do that? Yes, I work with the CEOs one-on-one. -on -one. I work with their top teams, so CEO plus the direct reports, mm -hmm. and I develop the next generation of leaders. So typically, people who are two levels or three levels below the CEO and have potential to move up the ranks. And I find that we can have uh, sometimes more impact when we work with someone who's 40 years old and we can still change their mindset rather than working with someone who's 55 years old. And I mm -hmm. can say that very uh, comfortably because I'm older than 55, so <laughs> I, I can make fun of myself as well. And, and then where do I do that? I do that, well, where the people work, right? So in their boardrooms mm -hmm. and their offices, but I also take them on, on retreats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I create a space where, because they're no longer in the office, but they are in a, in a place connected with nature, for example, yes. uh, the dynamics change. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly, you don't need to dress up in a, in a suit. You can be wearing a, a, a polo and shorts and, and you can even go to the to the meeting barefoot if you want. I, I, I'm well known for showing up uh, yeah. barefoot <laughs> at, 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 my, at my retreats because I... Why wear shoes? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. And, and when people are in their office, they, they, there's a lot of posture. Yeah, but the way you look, the way you talk, the, the 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 secretaries who walk into the office asking you to sign papers. So there's a whole, a whole of a lot of power play and posturing and pretending and uh, take people out of their office, take them in outside in a in a place with trees or lakes or mountains or the sea, the beach around them, and and those power dynamics change completely because yes. suddenly you're in t-shirt and shorts. And uh, uh, obviously, I'm talking about going somewhere in Southeast Asia and not in <laughs> Norway in yeah. winter, right? But <laughs> yeah. the, the, the power dynamics change completely and, and people start opening up. And I'm not even mentioning the fact that being connected to nature yeah. completely changes your inner level of energy. It's, you, can, you can notice that uh, mm -hmm. stress levels yes. go down. Uh, and that's all research based. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. we, we all have the numbers to show it, but just just being surrounded by nature puts you in a much, much different place where the stress goes down, cortisol goes down, uh, you're feeling much more peaceful. Because ultimately, that's where we come from, right? Mm -hmm. we, we come mm -hmm. from nature. We're not, yes. We didn't come from a steel and glass uh, tower. Uh, downtown that is uh, illuminated 24 7 eh? yeah yes yeah, yes yes so uh, to go back to your question you know retreats yes but it's part and parcel mm. of developing leaders for a better world mm -hmm. it's a tool yeah yes it's not an end per se the retreat is 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 nice but it, it serves a, a greater purpose to to bring people in a different space 
Yes, yes. I love it. I love to hear that, that uh, you are well in a in a corporate working environment, Mackenzie. But you have a role that is so well. First of all, is who you are, because anyhow, also like me, we cannot lead and and uh, walk our talk if we are not what we are saying, you know? So if we, we are saying for people to really listen, you know, uh, for leaders to listen, to grow others, it's because we, we have the experience, you no, know, and we know it works. And also because we are who we are and we are creating what we love. So in, in your case, it's also like me, you're, you're in a place where you, are openly who you are <laughs> and are, are leading through what you love to create with all these um, possibilities of, of, of creation and, and, uh, and empowering others so that they also are able to do the same or be the same. That's true. It's very hard to <laughs> not embody what you're recommending mm -hmm. to others. It, it feels very fake. Yes, and it is. To be transparent, because I work in a large firm that, and, and McKinsey is well known for being yeah. an environment that has extremely high standards, extremely standards of excellence, standards of quality. I mean, we're very, we're very, very demanding with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So it's not an easy environment to, to, to work in. It's a very fulfilling environment, but mm -hmm. it's not an easy environment. Yeah. Let's not pretend that no. you, you join McKinsey and, and you're going to be on holidays. Huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's be, let's be very, <laughs> but yeah. transparent in case anyone who's listening to this wants to to join McKinsey and say I'm gonna be like Fabrice doing podcasts from the villa in the south of France, you know. No. That's... no. <laughs> first first you have to work pretty hard yeah. <laughs> from the moment you join to the moment you become your elected a partner, and then you continue working yeah. hard to to stay a, uh, to, to stay a partner at the firm. So it's not a holiday. Yeah. Um, and so there are times where I feel that pressure. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's probably not a single day when I don't feel that pressure. Mm -hmm. Just to give you an example, I started my day at 7 a.m. this morning with a mm -hmm. call with colleagues in, in Hong Kong and China. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm on holidays here, but I still take a call at 7 a.m. Yes. I don't know if it's good or bad. It is what it is. We have clients to serve. We have priorities. This is a meeting that I preferred not to postpone because mm -hmm. I, I felt we needed to stay in the flow and, and keep pushing things. And I don't think my holidays should be coming in the way of serving our clients. Yeah. But we can debate whether Fabrice is an idiot for taking calls at <laughs> 7 a.m. in the morning. It's it's the, and, your and, choice and, and it's your. Uh, it's my choice. Nobody put it. a gun to yeah. my head. My colleagues would have understood if I had said, "Sorry, I'm on holidays. I'm not mm -hmm. doing this call." Yeah. Uh, the way I reconcile this with myself is is to find a balance. So mm -hmm. yes, I have a call at seven a.m., but then I have the joy of of speaking with you Thank at you. eleven. <laughs> Thank you. And then my entire afternoon is free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because my wife is traveling today she she had to go to to london for for a meeting i have the house to myself and so mm -hmm. i'm going to create a mini retreat yeah true. of essentially doing nothing and just being and looking at the view looking at the sea and maybe i'll go for a for a swim later and mm -hmm. and so I'm, I'm rebalancing now when i work and you know, it's a it's a normal work day in, in Bangkok or in Jakarta or in Singapore. I'm not I'm not doing this, right? But I, I always find time to carry on with my own practices. Yes. And I find that that's the 
the, the, the skeleton, the spine, if you want, that allows me to be able to walk the talk. Mm -hmm. And I think every one of my colleagues in, in my practice, so I'm not the only one at McKinsey who does this type of work. We're, mm -hmm. we're not a very large number, but it's not negligible either. Uh, and, and so I have colleagues around the world uh, and, and obviously a number of colleagues in, in my team in Asia. And I find that everyone is fairly disciplined in adhering to their personal practices, whatever they are, mm -hmm. physical practices, keeping fit, in shape, going to the gym, mm -hmm. maintaining your, your, your physical body, but also uh, meditative and contemplative practices, going into your inner space, mm -hmm. Noticing what is what is happening with you. Am I stressed today? Am I anxious? Yeah. Am I fearful? Uh, journaling, reading, uh, having wisdom conversations with friends. So whatever whatever yeah. it is, right? Yeah. Uh, regular retreats. So for example, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I I went and spent uh, four days in a Benedictine monastery. Mm -hmm. And that was four days of silence. Mm -hmm. So we we all have our yeah. our practices, and that's what allows us to to be able to show up, hopefully at our best when we work with our clients, but yes. also we work with our colleagues. I don't work alone. I have a bunch of McKinsey colleagues yeah. working with me, and they are the you know the hardworking A type, uh, very very bright uh, strategists. Who, who bring absolutely amazing uh, problem-solving skills to our clients. And, and, and I support them by creating a space where they mm -hmm. can also truly be themselves and, mm -hmm. and perhaps see, a, yes, you know, we need to help our client focus on the bottom line, but maybe there's something else where, where yes. we, we can help also our client create an environment where people can flourish. Yes. So, yes. yeah, we, we need our practices. Otherwise, we... We become a robot, right? Yeah, no, no, it's it's a part of yeah. We need to to live in harmony. We have to, um, well, for my case, it's, it's the living from the inside out. No, it's a really every moment, like you were saying, no, knowing if you're stressed or not. It's this observation of where you are and how you are being impacted and how you're responding. No, and it's single every single moment. And for those things, we need, uh, for instance, I swim in the morning early morning at six or, or journaling, like you're saying, or meditations or, and once in a while retreats. And th that makes me ask you <laughs> about your book. Hmm? You have also in all and everything you do, you also have a book, no? Yes. The art of retreats. Retreat. I, um, Of, of writing a book for, I don't know, maybe 20 years or so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I didn't do it because I, I was essentially busy doing other things. Uh, with hindsight, it was very good that I didn't write a book 20 years ago. <laughs> that would have been a pile of crap. <laughs> it's, it, it takes... It, I, I'm glad I had the 20 years to... To mature and 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 get some wisdom, which I then poured into the book, and the book wrote itself in three months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was so uh, editing the book, getting it to the finish line was very hard work. After that, but the first draft really poured out of me very very quickly. Nice, yeah. And it's um, it's called the art of retreat because I have uh, come to the conclusion that every uh, everyone and particularly business leaders because that's the people I work with and the people I really understand best but I think it applies from for everyone really every walk of life uh, every situation every culture every age doesn't mm -hmm. doesn't matter we we all benefit from taking time off Mm -hmm. and uh, the way I describe it is, is is the intersection of the horizontal 
and, and the vertical line, the, the horizontal line is time. So we, mm -hmm. we're in the world where time dictates everything we do. Yeah. It's particularly obvious in the corporate world. Every time we say, we want to reach this objective, we want to, whatever, increase sales by $1 billion. Mm -hmm. Inevitably, there will be a date associated with that objective. Yes. As if walking a, a path has to come with an indication of the speed at which you need to walk the path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which we take for granted. Whenever we say, here's a corporate objective, we're going to hire 25 additional people for this department, and that should be done by October. Yes. Always, 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 always. And we never question this assumption. Why do we put a time label next to any action or any result we want to, to achieve? Mm -hmm. I challenge that with business leaders. I say, look, first of all, you're going to get it wrong and your project is going to be delayed because 99.99% .99 of everything we do is delayed. So why are you setting yourself for misery by putting a timeline that statistically, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're well-meaning and you truly believe that you're going to achieve this objective by this date, but statistically, you're not. Mm -hmm. So why are you doing this to yourself? Mm -hmm. Oh, because I want to motivate my people. If I don't put a timeline, they're going to be sitting on their butt doing nothing. And I said, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? You need to instill the fear of missing sure, deadlines yeah. in order for people to show up at their best and do the best they, they, they can. Is this how you want to, to lead? I, said, oh, well, uh, I myself, you know, I am motivated by deadlines. I say, well, if I remove the deadlines, would you stay at home in bed watching Netflix all day long? No, of course not. I would still go to work. I think then. So we, we have this horizontal dimension that is conditioned by time. And, and, it, and the association of an objective and a timeline is extremely violent. I think it creates a world of tremendous violence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Having objectives is good. Having a direction of the journey is fantastic. But putting a timeline... Okay. Is, is actually a, an act of violence. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure so on you. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it creates... Everything, pressure a, everywhere. Unnecessary yeah. pressure. It creates a fictitious environment yeah. in which yeah. we pretend we know the future. So mm -hmm. a, budget, mm -hmm. a budget exercise is, is mm. a perfect illustration mm. of that. This is the budget for 2025. So when once we have published the budget, we, we feel comfortable because we know the future, except that no one knows the future. And so your budget is just a piece of paper with a little bit of ink on it. Yeah. As we saw when COVID happens, all yeah. the budgets that we had developed in 2019, December, we could basically burn them and, and yes. do a beautiful bonfire in March 2020 because COVID happened. Mm -hmm. And then the same when Russia invades Ukraine and, mm -hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. We yes, cannot predict really the future. Yeah. And less and less because the world has become very nonlinear and small, small events create massive, massive disruptions in the world. So what's um, maybe you want to have a budget because you want to have certain gateways where by the time we achieve this in sales, then we can spend so much. It, it's discipline. Okay, fine. I don't have a problem with that. But pretending that the budget is a re representation of the future is grossly misleading and it's very violent. So in to, to balance this horizontal world in which we live, which is the world of doing, mm -hmm. doing, 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 mm -hmm. action, 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 by, by this deadline, by this timeline, etc. There's the world of the, the vertical line, which is the world of being and, and, yes. and basically being focused on the present moment. Yes. And that is the world in which the contemplatives live. It, it's the world of just being mm -hmm. present. Mm -hmm. It's the world of deepening. It's the world of awareness. Yes. It's the world of mindfulness. Yeah. If you think of it, it's the only reality we have. Yeah, yeah it's the one. It's on, the on your horizontal timeline, the past is the past. It doesn't yeah. exist anymore. The future is just, uh, you know, a product of your imagination. We don't know what the future will be like. So the only reality that we know for sure is the present moment. Mm -hmm. So to come back to the uh, book, 
it's how do we immerse ourselves in the present moment by taking time off. And I suggest to do that on retreats, which means go to a nice place where you can be comfortable and disconnect all the electronics and the notifications and the Zoom and the emails and everything. Spend time by yourself and deepen the present moment. And I guide the reader into examining a number of themes. Uh, and then there's a few important themes, uh, like, for example, developing and deepening relationships, mm -hmm. uh, finding purpose, mm -hmm. uh, embracing death, mm -hmm. uh, and dancing with complexity, mm -hmm. uh, living the journey and not the destination. Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's a number yeah. of themes like this. That, and, and I guide the reader into deepening in these themes. So that's that's the nice. that's the the story of the book. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's especially it's it's good for, for um, what you're saying you know, for for who you work also to for them to understand the importance of those retreats. You no, know, going inside the importance of going inside to stop going inside and then from there create do. But before creating, which you are doing, you have to be. Yeah. Yes, and, and the two worlds, I find marry very well. The world of doing alone is extremely sterile. Mm -hmm. it, it's, yeah. it's just it's where a we're world going. in which yeah. the, the, pre the present is always not good enough. And so mm -hmm. I will be happy when, right? That's, that's the yeah. horizontal world. You know, we, uh, our cells are X, but we will be happy when our cells are two X. <laughs> or, you know, we will be yeah. happy when we reach a valuation of $1 billion, because then we will be rich. Mm -hmm. And I, the founder, will take $250 million home. But you know what? I will really be happy when I'm a billionaire, because $250 million is not enough. Yes. So it's, it's a world of I will be happy when. Yeah. The yeah. current situation is not good enough. This is this is a situation of deficiency. Of, mm -hmm. of this is not good. I'm not happy. But there's salvation, which is usually in in uh, in numbers, right? I yeah. will be happy when I reach this. I will be happy when I'm promoted. I will be happy when I make a million dollars, whatever, right? And I find that the vertical world only. Is also insufficient. It's a beautiful world. It's it's rich for your inner life, and and I truly admire people. The you know the the deep contemplatives, like for example the monks who live in the monastery mm -hmm. where where I did a retreat. I mean, it's mm -hmm. truly remarkable individuals. But that doesn't work very well in the in, in the corporate world, right? I'm not going to show up with my Benedictine uh, uh, you know costume and 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 be in prayer. Uh, all day long that that's mm -hmm. not going to to really work so i find that the best of both worlds is when we combine action with contemplation mm -hmm. yes in whichever proportions uh, yeah, yeah, yes. uh, it could be you know 99 percent action but then one percent of the time which is three days a year i go on a retreat it could be 95 5 it could be mm -hmm. 70 30 whatever mm -hmm. but put periods of contemplation Yes. In your life, whether it's 10 minutes of meditation in the morning, 10 minutes of journaling at the end of the day, a one hour walk without your phone, but bring your dog with you mm -hmm. and go into the forest. Yes. And you do that every weekend. Yes. Whatever that is. But these times when we are in solitude, in silence, in a nice space and opening to our, to our soul. I think these times of retreat, whether it's 10 minutes, one hour here, two days in, in a in a you know in a cabin in the woods, yeah. whatever that is, whatever. is really a, a massive enabler of your life in the world of doing. Yes, yes. It's uh, at the end it's an impulse. It's a it's a it's um you're enriching yourself to then give to then do it's this enabler like you were saying so yes so it's the back and forth mm -hmm. between doing and being yes and doing and being action yes. and contemplation yes. action and contemplation that that really 
creates the the, the richness mm -hmm. of what you can do as a, as a mm -hmm. human being. Yes. So thank you so much, Fabrice. Thank you so much for co-creating a conversation with me, for having been here with me. And um, it has been a pleasure and an honor. I, I love your, um, your being. I love your heart and I appreciate a lot what you're doing to this world. Thank you so much. Enjoyed the co-creation of the conversation, <laughs> and, uh, knowing that you're in Barcelona in Spain, which is a country dear to my heart, uh, it just increases the, the pleasure I've had uh, with you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome. When you're around, let me know. <laughs> I will. <laughs>